Hello, hockey fans. You're listening to Hockey by Northwest, the show where we talk about the only teams you care about, the Vancouver Canucks, Calgary Flames, Edmonton Oilers, and Winnipeg Jets. I'm your host, Brendan Monroe, and with me tonight is Sean Miller. Good evening to everyone. Today we continue our series of previews and look ahead to the first season back in the NHL in 15 years for the city of Winnipeg as they embrace their Jets back. And it's been a long wait for Winnipeg hockey fans. The former Jets leaving in 1996 and over the last few years Winnipeg was really played by the NHL. They were always a city that they might move a team to and I think the hopes kept getting up in Winnipeg and were let down time and time again and as we saw earlier this summer it looked like it wasn't even going to be the ultimate team that ended up there it looked like it was going to be Phoenix that was going to move to Winnipeg well that didn't happen the Atlanta Thrashers are now gone from the deep south and are now home in the frozen north on Portage and Maine Sean what do you think about the return of hockey to Winnipeg well I think it's a great thing I think it's a great thing for the city of Winnipeg it's been a long time coming like you alluded to um, they got played for quite a while by the uh, NHL. After the MTS Center got built a few years ago, they were a viable option, like the trump card in the deck. That they got to wave at uh, owners that were wavering, cities that were wavering in their support and say, look, we're going to send the team to Winnipeg. You better, better sign a deal. Better give us $25 million in cash, right? Right? Or build a new arena. Well, absolutely. And then give us $25 million in cash every year anyway, even after you build a new arena, because you can't sell tickets. Right. Because you built it in the wrong part of town, Phoenix. Um, you know, it's great for them to be back, that aside. All that circus stuff is done now, and I think it's great. Um, it is worth a note that it did take um, an ownership group in Atlanta that would not sell the building along with the team to a prospective owner. An ownership group that really was just trying to get rid of the NHL team so that they could sell the NBA team and the building to somebody else. It is important to know that that's what it took to send the uh, team back to Winnipeg. I think Winnipegers need to keep that in mind that they're on a thin thread. The NHL, I don't think, was thrilled to go back there. They'll say that they are, but they obviously, it took some prodding. That said, season ticket sales should have done something to help them out. Um, we had a conversation earlier off the air, of course, where we mentioned, uh, Brendan had mentioned, uh, they probably are going to get more uh, full-price tickets sold, I bet you, in the first handful of games in Winnipeg than Atlanta has sold in the last number of years. Well, there's no, no doubt reason. There's no doubt the enthusiasm for hockey in Winnipeg ex- is exceptionally, exceptionally stronger than it was in Atlanta. And hopefully that'll translate into support for the team in terms of how they respond to playing in home ice. I think it's going to be a lot different playing in front of 15,000 fans every night than it would have, be, would have been playing in front of five, six, seven thousand 7,000 fans on any given night in Atlanta. Although the trade-off, of course, is that they're still playing in the Southeast Division. So despite the advantage of playing at home, they're going to be on the road for much of the year. So I guess the name Jets is appropriate because they will be spending most of their season in the air. I would agree, yeah. I mean, it's no worse than any Western Conference team. I mean, your top travel teams are still going to be Detroit, Vancouver, and Edmonton, right? But I think it's not going to be traveling any further than those teams. So, I mean, I think they can still succeed. Obviously, Detroit's had a model for success for years, and they're always in the top travel in the league. And there'll be realignment next year, as the league has alluded to. So, once um, we get this team on the ice in Winnipeg, what do you think fans can expect? And let's take a look at their team starting in goal. Andre Pavlic, he's a good young goaltender. He's their starter. Uh, many of you will remember him as the goalie who collapsed in the middle of a game last season. No one is sure, was really sure what had happened to him. And he's healthy. He's good. Uh, he may ultimately end up reminding Jets fans of a young Nikolai Habibulin, someone that's capable of stealing hockey games and keeping his team in games when they shouldn't be. And reliable backup Chris Mason will be picking up whatever slack that Pavlic has uh, Sean, what are your thoughts on the goaltending situation? I think this is the real strength for this franchise. Um, Andre Pavlik is the kind of goaltender, he may not wow you every night, but he's a solid, consistent goaltender. The save percentage right around the mid-914, 915. Um, it's been improving the last couple of years, so he's trending upwards. And, you know, I, I think it's a, good, it's a good base for this franchise. I think he's a good fit for the team. He's a big guy, 6'3", which is kind of the trend now for goalies. And I, I think he's going to do a good job there. I think this will be a real position of strength for this franchise. And it has to be. Because there are a lot of question marks as we move out from there. 
Yes, yeah, as, as we do move up from there, there are definitely question marks about the defense, led by Dustin Bufflin, who really is actually a forward. If you take a look at the number of shots he took last year, 347 shots, he's more likely to shoot than pass. He's more likely to charge than he is to stay back. And offense also seems to come naturally to defenseman Tobias Enstrom, who I think is going to be one of the most dynamic and interesting players to watch on this Jets roster this year. And then rounding out their defense is Zach Bogosian, who's really an enigma. He signed a new contract extension this week, and it'll be a wait-and-see kind of contract. Not a lot of term, just a $2.5 million cap hit, and they are still trying to unwrap the enigma that is Zach Bogosian. Sean, what are your thoughts on the defense? Well, I, I'd like to agree with you on a few of those things. Um, definitely they've got a quite a large forward, apparently a rather large forward playing, a boat even, playing on defense in uh, Dustin Bufflin. Um, jokes aside, he, he's still a pretty solid defender. I mean, his plus minus is only minus two, and a team that struggles at times to be the top defender and have a minus two and play in the All-Star game, that's pretty impressive. Um, Tobias Enstrom has got to be one of the most memorable steals or gems to be found late in the draft. He was drafted in the eighth round in 2003, and he put up 51 points last year. That's a pretty good steal. I think he's a he's a great stud for them to have back there, kind of a number two defenseman. Maybe not a 1A, but certainly a number two defenseman that will still go to holes for them. Um, but Gojin is a big question mark. I think it's really good for the franchise that they got away, signing with a little money and little term, because I know we heard some discussion on the radio from insiders that you know he might be negotiating a la Luke Shen, and Luke Shen's looking for north of $4 million a season. And with similar numbers, you'd hate to be paying a guy who only had 17 points last year $4 million a season. That's the kind of contract that can cripple a smaller market team, which Winnipeg will still be. Yes, and their payroll should not be uh, exceptionally high compared to many of the other Canadian teams. In fact, it'll, it'll be the lowest of the Canadian teams for sure, and it'll probably rank still in the bottom third of teams in the NHL this season. Absolutely, and... We'll have to see how that does. I mean, Winnipeg is not Hawaii. Um, I think been a, that's been discussed at length. So it's really going to be interesting to see how they can put a franchise together that's competitive, while not having a ton of money to overcome some of their obvious disadvantages. If Winnipeg is going to be a competitive team on the ice this season, they'll have to rely on some pretty young forwards, of course. Their captain, Andrew Ladd, is only 25 years old. He's a great player to build a team around. Scored 29 goals last year, a two-time Stanley Cup winner. Joining him will be Evander Kane, scored 19 goals last year. He's only 20. There'll be a lot of Evander Kane jerseys sold in Winnipeg this year, I'm sure. Uh, Brian Little, who had an outstanding junior career, has scored 30-plus goals in the past, struggled a little bit in the last two seasons. And then your forward core is rounded off by the mysterious Russians in Nick Antropov, whose maybe better days are behind him. Uh, He seems to have leveled off or plateaued in his career. Uh, Alexander Burmistrov is on the opposite end of his career. Big questions, not really sure what's going to come of him, although it seems like he's got all the skill in the world. And then finally, Blake Wheeler, who every good team needs a guy like Blake Wheeler, an established NHL player, big guy, plays a checking role, can score 20 goals, he's reliable, he stays healthy, and he's a good core player. Sean, who do you like on forward? And just keep in mind, we've got about a minute left. All right. Um, I like a lot, of, a lot of players we're talking about there. Andrew Ladd is a great captain. Uh, I can remember his first time playing against Edmonton in 2006. He is the kind of guy who will drive right through the opposition's goalie on his quest for the Stanley Cup and not going to roll the for the rest of the series. <laughs> um, he's a great player. I have a lot of respect for him. Um, Brian Little, I think, is the biggest question mark up front. He's the guy. They do not have a, a huge ton of strength down the middle. And Brian Little is the little guy that's going to have to fill that role. And, you know, with his drop-off in goal production from 30 down to what, 11 last season or 18 last season, you got to wonder if he can find that touch again, if he can be that number one guy. Because if he can't, then there's going to be some scoring problems. I don't think he scored last year at 59 points. You, know, you compare that to the elite teams in the NHL, 59 points is not enough for your leading goal scorer. You need to have people and point producers in the 85 to 90 range to be a truly elite franchise. So I think the quest is for the Jets to find that guy, to find the team with the lining, right? So, I mean, that'll be what they'll be working on this season. That's their main challenge at home front. There'll be no team with Solani on this team, I don't think, this year, and I don't think that the Jets will have that whiteout playoff magic that they used to. Not the first season back in Winnipeg, but exciting times in Winnipeg this season as the Jets return to the NHL. That's about all the time we have for today's show. Thanks for joining me. I'm Brendan Monroe. With me today was Sean Miller, and uh, you've been listening to Hockey by Northwest. Join us next time. <laughs>